Good morning and welcome. If you will stand to your feet, we'll do our choral call to worship this morning. We have great fellowship in this church. That's right. That's right. <laughs> After that, let's go to the Lord in prayer together uh, before a word of welcome. Lord, we have just sung that we believe your presence is in this place with us. Lord, help us not to take that lightly. In no uh, place, in no location in Scripture will we ever see anyone taking the presence of God lightly. Everywhere we see your presence in Scripture, it's prepared for. It's the matter of utmost focus. Everything is planned around it. Concessions are made to it. People kneel before you. So let that be our posture this morning, Lord. A posture of a heart kneeling before you focused on what we might hear from you, what you want to do in and through our time together this morning. Be that through the fellowship, be that through the singing of your word, the praying of your word, the preaching of your word. Lord, in all of these things, make us mindful of you. And mindful in a way, Lord, that leaves us changed. That causes us to react to You. That You are not a passive presence. But, oh God, You are active in worship and in the lives of those who are gathered here and in this community and among the nation and the nation's. So God, it's our our privilege, our honor to gather, Lord, to be in Your presence. Would You deal with our sin, the sin we need dealt with? Would You encourage us? Would You charge us up for this life that You've called us to, a life of followership, a life wherein we take Your presence with us? And that others in this community would think and would, would see that they've been in in God's presence when they spend time with us because our lives so exude You and Your character. Our words are so infused with Your Word. 
that they have a mindfulness even about them. Lord, thank you for these, my brothers and sisters, who have come this morning to corporate worship, to gather together as a body of Christ to worship. Would you bless us? Would you bless the other churches in this area that are faithful to your gospel and to your word? They're not enemies, Lord. They're friends. They're teammates. We root for them. Work in and through these these wonderful things, the preaching, the praying, the fellowship in those churches just as much, if not more, even than here. And it'll be our joy to see that happen. But it'll definitely be our joy to see it happen here. With these things we bring to you, we leave before your throne. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Welcome. It's great to see each of you. If you've not seen uh, me before, uh, most of you probably have, but my name is Patrick Arbo. I'm Pastor Bill's son. Pastor Bill uh, and my mom, Cheryl, have been visiting my brother and his wife uh, and kind of helping out there for a few days. I know their, uh, their visit was uh, greatly appreciated and had a big impact. Uh, it was a sacrifice for you to let them go uh, for a little while, so thank you for doing so. They had a great impact uh, where they went, and you can join me today in praying for them uh, as they travel back this way. Uh, But it's always a a joy for me to fill in uh, for my dad and to be here with you. And we're going to have a wonderful morning of worship together. I want to start with one announcement. Uh, The outline of today's message, I was told to mention this, is on the You Before Me sheets that are at the back of the sanctuary. You can see them on either side. So if you are a note taker, I am. You may not be, that's okay. You don't have to have one. Uh, But if you're a note taker like I am and you like to follow along and it helps you to kind of stay checked in, to have some things to look at. Uh, that is on the back of the You Before Me sheet, along with a lot of other announcements uh, that you'll probably want to pay attention to. Uh, I was able to kind of follow along loosely with your outreach opportunity uh, yesterday at the Fall Festival. I thought that was awesome. Uh, and, and kudos to those of you who came to, to serve and to reach out to this community uh, in and, and through that event. I uh, heard a lot about it but I'm sure that was a wonderful thing. Uh, if there are no other major announcements that I have missed, if, does anybody have any major announcements that I might have missed for the upcoming weeks? No? Okay. Well, let me ask you to stand with me once more, and we're going to read Scripture together for our call to worship. And this will come from Romans, the book of Romans, which this, this passage in Romans 12 acts as a, a wonderful... Uh, Not counterbalance, but it has a lot to say about the passage that we're going to be in together uh, during the message time in Thessalonians. So this is what the Word of the Lord says in Romans 12, 9 through 18. When I'm done, uh, we will worship together in song once more. This is what God's Word says, beginning in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly Affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Let's worship together. We'll go ahead and dismiss our children for Children's Church. Miss Carolyn will meet you in the back. Rise to 
can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness take it to the Lord in Are there trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Is there trouble anywhere? As we look around right now, as we watch the news, as we keep our eyes open, are there trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Let's do that now. Father, as we open Your Word, would You open our eyes to behold wonderful things? Would You give us the capacity, Holy Spirit, to understand what we've heard? Not just in a practical sense, but in a spiritual sense. To understand and apply Your Word. That we might be changed for our good and for your glory, in Christ's name, amen. Well, good morning. It, uh, it's just so good to be here with you. It's so good to be here with you. If you'll turn uh, in your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we are going to pick up in verse 9. Now, chronologically, amongst all of the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament that we have in the New Testament that are canonized, the first written was 1 Thessalonians. It was the first of them all, and that's where we're going to be this morning. Paul's letters are often broken down into three categories. Pastoral letters, that's First and Second Timothy and Titus, where Paul is giving advice to young pastors and qualifications to young pastors. And then you have the prison letters or the prison epistles, and those are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And you might actually put 2 Timothy in there as well, because in 2 Timothy, Paul has squarely in view his imminent uh, execution at the hands of Rome. You might call that a death row epistle. And all of the other letters are what we call general letters or ecclesiastical letters. That is, letters to the church 
And of those, the first written was 1 Thessalonians. And these letters, I just want to say here at the beginning, because I, I hope it kind of informs as we move on, these letters would have been read aloud. Often there are directions in the letters about them being read aloud. So the letter would have been delivered to this local body of believers and they would have gathered together and then the letter would have been read aloud in their midst. And I feel like these that kind of changes the way in some manner. I don't, maybe it's a mystical way, but it kind of changes the way in which I hear it or I see the words in the text. They would have been read aloud. And this letter represents Paul's bold response to those who were trying to stir up the Thessalonican church against him. You can see all this played out in, in the backdrop of church history, really from about Acts 15 to Acts 18 and 19. But according to Acts 17, 5, these jealous and wicked men had opposed Paul and the gospel from the get-go, even running them out of town with a persecution that was so intense. And so now they've crept back in, they've slithered back in like slimy little salamanders, and they're whispering into Paul or into the ears of, of this church, Paul abandoned you. Therefore, you ought to abandon this gospel. He's not here. He's a fair weather friend, this Paul. You should come back to what you've known, to what's comfortable. And in this letter, 1 Thessalonians, Paul pushes back big time. One might say he dunks on their heads. And actually, uh, Paul uses uh, somebody mentioned in one of his pastoral letters, Timothy, as evidence that they had never abandoned the church of Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 3, so this same letter, but a little bit earlier, it gives us context. Paul writes, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, this persecution I was talking about, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, but we sent you Timothy our brother and God's co-worker in the Gospel of Christ, to establish and to exhort, encourage you in your faith that no one would be moved by these afflictions, these lies, these tales that were being spun. For you yourselves know that we were destined for this. So Timothy's report, once he joins Paul again in Corinth in Acts 18.5, was a good one. It was one that I would go so far as to say every single pastor would love to get about the church that he shepherds and leads and loves and serves. And we'll see that this morning, and we'll see it as a model for us to follow. As Paul exhorts this Thessalonican church to love well, to live well, and to lead well. Those are the three big encouragements. Now, we're going to jump in. Just one more thing about, uh, one more little pretext here. Where we jump in, the text that we jump in has a now at the beginning. It starts with a now, and that is what we call an adversative participle. That's a big word that literally just means you're about to get a counterexample. You're about to get the other side of the story. So I could say, for example, this burger was terrible and dry and flavorless, but now this burger was juicy and had tons of flavor and was incredible. You see what the now did? It means I'm moving on to something else. I had to correct you here. I had something to say here. But now I'm going to move on to, to, to something that we're going to treat in a different way. So what was the before? Because that tells us a little bit about something that we're going to look at. Well, Paul has just spent verses 1 through 8 of this uh, chapter 4 giving some counsel and admonition to the church about their purity, about their sexual purity. The culture into which the gospel was advancing was one of sexual deviancy and unrestrained carnal lust. Now, I know that sounds like no culture that you know, but it was the case there. Pregnant pause. In C.S. Lewis' book, The Four Loves, he explains the, the four different words and ways that the Bible talks about love. Storge, which is empathetic love. A love that's based in empathy for someone else. Philea love, which is brotherly love. There's eros, from which we get erotic. Eros, romantic love. And then finally, agape, which is God's unconditional love. And so in the passage that we're in, 
Paul has just moved from talking about eros with the church for a little bit and the proper confines for that and what it's supposed to look like. And he says, but now on philia love, on brotherly love, you're killing it. You're doing so good. And that's where we're going to spend our time this morning is on the brotherly love section. So he's corrected them a little bit on this side of things, but he says, but now you're doing awesome over here. And that's what we're going to look at together. Let's see it. First Thessalonians, we're going to read and work through verses 9 through 13 of chapter 4. And here comes that big now in verse 9. Now, it says, leaving that, now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone even to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God how to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing to all of the brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. Now, one other thing I want to hit you with at the beginning so you don't get nervous. This is a front-loaded message. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on the love portion in this, this first section. And you're going to think when I get to the end of it, Arbo, there's no way you've got two more points to go through or I'm hitting those doors. Hang with me. It gets more practical and therefore takes less time uh, as we get to the, the second two parts. So we're going to kind of sit for a little while in this first part as we talk about loving well like Christ. If you're taking notes, that would be your first Big two blanks. And the Holy Spirit, who is superintending and inspiring the quill of Paul, tells us that we will love well, like Christ, through three big ideas, three big things. Imitation of Jesus. Immersion in our community and amongst the people that we live with. And then finally, intensification. Let's look at the first. Imitation. Loving well, like Christ, by imitating Christ. Look at it in verse 9. Now concerning brotherly love, Philadelphus, from which we get Philadelphia, brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God, <clears throat> excuse me, to love one another. <clears throat> I need my coffee. Anybody had this gunk that's been going around? I think it's making its way to me. Pardon me. Mm. Get behind me, Satan, by the power of coffee. Paul tells these brothers and sisters that they scarcely need to be advised about their love for one another. And it seems to me that there are two reasons for this. Paul provides two reasons for this. One, they're acing the test. Right? Where love for one another is concerned, they're, they're killing it. That's clear from verses 10 and 11 where he goes on to describe kind of what their love looks like. But secondly, and I think more importantly, Paul says... You yourselves, now hear this church, he means you as well. You yourselves have been taught by God how to love one another. That's huge. This was itself a fulfillment of prophecy, even as it was an assurance to the people of God. Jesus gave his disciples the same assurance. John 6.45, it's written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Now his disciples would have known, as Jesus knew, that Jesus was talking about himself there. He says, in listening to me, you are hearing from God. You are being taught by God. So it was being fulfilled in that moment, even as it was fulfilled among the Thessalonican church. Jesus says, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And indeed they had. Let me give you a few of the different ways that they were commanded to imitate the love of Jesus. First, they were to imitate Jesus' servant-hearted love. Right after the, the foot washing, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. So I gave you the model, now you follow it. Just so you are also to love one another. They were to imitate Jesus' sympathetic love. His servant-hearted love, but also His sympathetic love. When Jesus finally gets to the tomb where Lazarus has been laid, He's so affected in His love for Lazarus that, that he weeps, and the, the outsiders in that situation, the Jewish people look in, and they say in John eleven thirty six, 36, see how he loved him. And we'll see later about walking properly before outsiders. 
And there's Jesus giving us a model to follow. As people looked in from the outside and said, that's what it means to love a person. Something about the way that Jesus is reacting to this is a model to follow. See how He loved Him? They were to imitate Jesus' sacrificial love. On the eve of His crucifixion, He says in John 15, 13, you know the verse, greater love has no one than this that what? Lay down His life for His friends. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Giving us a model of love to follow. But it gets deeper still. This one just absolutely just poked at my noodle the whole time I was working through this text and preparing for it. According to John 15, 9, their imitation of Jesus and our imitation of Jesus is an imitation of Jesus' own imitation. Wrap your mind around that. John 15, 9, As the Father has loved me, so... I have loved you. Abide in my love. As the Father has loved me, Jesus says. And what kind of love is that? It's a Trinitarian love. Which means what? It's an eternal love. It's always been, and it always will be. It's an eternal delight. There's always been delight, and there always will be. The kind of delight that upon His baptism, God would look down and say, what? This is my Son. In whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. That's the kind of love that Jesus imitates and therefore is worthy of our imitation. Brothers and sisters, just like this Thessalonican church family, we must love well like Christ by imitating the love of Jesus. That's why Paul exhorts Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.13, follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And Paul more clearly states this in another one of his general letters, the, one to the, first, uh, the first letter to the Corinthian church. And he sums up, he, he's been writing for 10 chapters. First, first Corinthians has 10 chapters and then he gets to to chapter 11, and in verse 1, he says, okay, I can basically sum all that up by saying this. Be imitators of me, Paul says, as I imitate Christ. And the Lord Jesus Himself said what? By this, everyone will know you're My disciples if you love one another. If you have love for one another. So why is this so hard for the capital C church? And I've heard from my dad that you're a very loving church. So I'm not focusing just here at FBCJ. But when you think about the Capital C Church, or maybe you've heard stories about other churches in the community, or maybe at one point in FBCJ's past, there's been a difficulty of loving one another. Why are churches known for infighting and gossip and slander and distrust and wariness and jealousy and selfish ambition? It's precisely these kind of churches who have just mailed it in on evangelism. You ever realize that? The least evangelistic churches are always the one in which there's the most infighting. Because they can't leave off fighting one another long enough to be focused on other people and their need for the Gospel. D.L. Moody shared this story. I love it. He said, show me a church where there's love and I'll show you a church that's powerful in its community. In Chicago a few years ago, a little boy attended a Sunday school I know of. When his parents moved to another part of the city, the little fellow still attended the same Sunday school, though it meant a long, tiresome walk each way. And so a friend asked him why he went so far and told him, you know, there are plenty of other churches that are just as good on your way to that church. And the boy replied, that may be good for others, but not for me. And the friend asked, well, why not? Hear this. Because they love a fellow over there. Because they love a fellow over there. If only we could make the world believe that we love them, there would be fewer empty churches and a smaller proportion of our population who never darkens the door of a church. Let love, I love this, let love replace duty in our church relations and the world will soon be evangelized. I'm here to tell you, FBCJ, we could get to 400 attendees around here we could get to a $2 million budget around here. We could have the best programs on the eastern seaboard around here. You may well, who can say? You can have the coolest VBS on the eastern seaboard here. I think you probably do. I've seen the videos and hear from Dad. We could have awesome ministries and, and 
beneficial programs and, and scalable outreach strategies and, 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 and it will all amount to a hill of beans. Worthless beans. If it can't be said about FBCJ, they love a fellow over there. They love a fellow over there. We're called to love well like Christ by imitating, but that's not all. We're also called to love well like Christ by immersion. That's what we see in the first part of verse 10. For that is indeed what you're doing with all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So here we see what was referred to a moment ago, this justification behind Paul's contention that he doesn't really even have much to say to the Thessalonians about this because they're already getting it right. Their love is all over the place. And this is a fulfillment of Christ's own promise in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all, focus on those, those words, in all Judea and to the ends of the earth. Jesus uses the words in all, and that yokes to an idea that we need to focus on for, for just a moment here. Notice the word throughout in our text. It says what you're doing to the brothers throughout Macedonia. In the Greek, that's a compound word, tusinilos, and it literally means in every part of. In every part of. And I make the distinction because there's a lot of different ways that we use the words throughout. I could tell you, I have, all, I have tons of leaves throughout my yard. Or I could say, uh, there are Dollar Generals all throughout this area. Or if you were watching the Tennessee game yesterday, I could say, there were a lot of yellow flags thrown throughout that game. And no matter what it felt like when you were watching it, we don't mean when we use throughout that way that there were literally nothing but flags all over the place. You couldn't watch anything, it was just flags just all over the place. Every square inch of the field was covered in flags. I don't mean that you won't be able to see any grass in my yard. Yeah, there's probably some leaves in my yard, but you'd be able to see some grass here and there. And yeah, there are a lot of Dollar Generals out there, but they're not over every square inch, okay? Okay. That's not the way we're using throughout when we say that in those contexts, but that's, how, that's exactly how Paul is using it. He says it's in every single part of, in every square inch of Macedonia, your love is known, and it's felt across every square inch. When Paul says that love of the Thessalonians has gone throughout, he means to every part of. Now let's take that and apply it to our context here. Pry it out and apply it to our context here. Let me say it another way. We're going to come at it from the other side of the street. How are we going to do that? This is what that means. There can be no pocket of our church and no pocket of our community where our love can't go. Let that settle in. Let that marinate. Because that applies across the board. Geographically, this neighborhood and, catch me here, that neighborhood. Our love has to be in both places in full effect if it's to be worthy of this kind of condemnation. Culturally, people who live this way and people who live that way. Our love has to be full in every place. Politically, hold on tight folks, people who vote this way and people who vote that way. And some of you may be thinking, but we're not supposed to love that kind of person though, right? Arbo? They'll think that we endorse that behavior or, or that idea or that agenda. Well, consider this. Romans 5, 8. What does it tell us? God demonstrated His own love for us in that what? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And He didn't anymore endorse our sin when He sent His Son to die for us then we'll be endorsing the sin of people that we love no matter where they are. And no matter what their life is like. Now, we must tell them the truth and stand on conviction. That's Ephesians 4 or 5. Rather, speaking the truth in what? Love. Speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. So I want you to close your eyes. This is going to be different, but I'm going to ask you to do it this morning. Close your eyes for just a moment. Now I want you to imagine somebody popping into your mind, or maybe a group of people, when I say two words. Are you ready? Eyes closed. What pops into, my mind, or into your mind and into my mind when I say, those people? Oh, those people. 
Now open your eyes. And know this, that in all likelihood, that's exactly the people or the person that Jesus would have made a beeline towards. He said, who needs the doctor? The sick, not the well. And the outsiders were always giving him problems for this, weren't they? Who? He eats with who? He talks with who? He goes to whose house? He invites who over? He loves on who? He took up for who? May it be said of FBCJ that this church's Jesus-imitating kind of love goes throughout to every part of this community. Throughout your school, throughout your workplace, throughout your baseball or your basketball league, throughout our state, throughout our nation, and to the nations. We must love well like Christ by imitating, but also immersing ourselves in our communities. But lastly, our love must intensify. Second part of verse 10. We urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Where love is concerned, let me say it this way, we must resist moderation. Throw moderation out the window. I mean, the Christian life is one of a ton of moderation, isn't it? And, and moderation is a good thing in a lot of those situations. You can have a little bit of this, but well, you can't have too much of it. You can do a little bit of this, but well, not too much of that. Aren't you aching for something that you can do without moderation? Well, good news. You can love without moderation. You don't have to keep any in the tank. You don't have to hold any back. You can pour it out nonstop. C.S. Lewis wrote in the Screw Tape Letters, if you've never read that book, it's, he, he had to get his mind and he had to pretend like he was an older demon who was writing advice to a younger demon. And it was so hard for him to write that about every three months he would just have to stop writing. So great was the spiritual oppression. But it's an interesting book to read because it kind of gives you a peek behind the enemy lines. And, and in that book, the older demon says to the younger one, a moderated religion, faith, love is as good for us as no religion, faith, or love at all. And it's certainly more amusing. See, Paul is at war against this love and moderation stuff, this frugality of love. Here in verse 10, Paul is reiterating an idea that he's already established. Back in 3.12, he says, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. And I love that idea of abound. It points to overflow. It's often rendered as overflow. That your love may increase and overflow for one another. He hits that same note with the Philippian church in his letter to them. Philippians 1.9, it's my prayer that your love may abound, overflow more and more with knowledge and all discernment. But I think the text that has the most to say about ours is, is in that letter to the church at Corinth. 13, verse 13. Now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Why? You ever thought about that? Why is the great... Hope and love... Faith, hope and faith are, are, are great. Why is the greatest of these love? Well, see, one day, and I'm pointing at that cross right there, hope will see its foundation and its guarantor. And one day, faith will be made sight. But we will love and be loved forever. Forever. Wrap your mind around that. Forever. Ever. Without moderation. Not only should our love go everywhere throughout, but everything we do should be permeated by our love, which in turn should be a love that's growing and multiplying. Paul says later in that same letter to the Corinthians 16, 14, let all you do be done in love. Last week I got to sit in on one of our Sunday morning life groups at RBC where I serve Ridgeview, and I remember the teacher uh, of that life group, he's our assistant pastor of discipleship, saying, it's almost as if the gospel hits you on its way to someone else. And I love that. I thought a lot about it. But I think the same thing is true of love. Love hits you on its way to someone else. We've already heard it from Jesus Himself. John 15, 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And the new commandment that I give to you, as I have loved you, love one another that same way. You see the pattern? 
The Father loves the Son and has displayed that love and favor. And then the Son loves us and has displayed that love and favor through His finished work on the cross. Which does what? It allows us to receive the love of Jesus and be changed so that like Him, we can love others in a life-giving way. Our love must grow and abound. Sam Levinson wrote, love at first sight is easy to understand. It's when two people have been looking at each other for years that it becomes a miracle. And that's somewhat humorous, but it's also profoundly serious, isn't it? It's easy to fall in love from across the room, but how will that love hold up when you see the flaws? When you learn about the baggage? When you see the imperfections? When you see all these in an ongoing and unrelenting way? It's the growing and the increasing of love that's difficult and important, not the falling in love. But this world will tell you the opposite, y'all. It's Hallmark movie season. And don't I know it? How many Hallmark movies have you seen that focus on someone's ongoing love through difficulty and tribulation and trial and that diagnosis and this thing and that thing? None of them. It's all about the falling in love and roll credits. Let me give you one more illustration about a young man who tried to find a shortcut past this increasing kind of love. An ingenious teenager, tired of reading bedtime stories to his little sister, decided to record several of her favorite stories on tape. So he told her, now you can hear these stories anytime you want. Isn't that great? And she looked at the machine and then dropped her little head and said, no, it doesn't have a lap. Let's not be like that young man. No matter how tempting it is, no matter how tempting it is to take them the gospel and then just leave them with a program. No matter how tempting it is to welcome them into membership with a, a firm two-pump handshake and then just trust that somebody else will care and look after them. No matter how tempting it is to let the initiating act of love be the final act of love. Let's resist that temptation. Now as we move on to the second part of our text, the instruction becomes somewhat more practical and therefore we require less unpacking. It was no less important though, and it's no less important for us so we're to love well like Christ, and in the second part, we're to live well in Christ. And he'll start by telling them, and us, that if we want to live well in Christ, we can't be a feather ruffler. We're going to use some bird analogies this morning. I don't know where that came from, but you know what? Hang in there with me. We'll get through this together. Bird analogies. Don't be a feather ruffler. That's the first part of verse 11. He says, aspire to live quietly. John MacArthur offers the following, and I think correct sense of what Paul's getting at. He says, this refers to someone who doesn't present societal problems, see note on, on 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, or generate conflict among the people in his life, but whose soul rests easy even in the midst of difficulty. In other words, it's someone who's not a feather ruffler. And we all know feather rufflers, don't we? Huh? And how much joy do they bring to our lives and to the body of Christ? Not much. Let me give you a few encouragements here. Don't be a feather ruffling son or daughter. Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Now, before you parents say, Amen, Arbo! Let's go to the next verse of Colossians. Don't be a feather ruffling parent. Colossians 3.21, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Don't be a feather ruffling sheep. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So let them do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. And before we pastors and you pastors in the room say, Amen, Arbo, you can't be a feather ruffling pastor either. That's 1 Timothy 3, 2 through 3. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, husband of one wife. There's a lot of other qualifications there. And then it says, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. And then one final one, don't be a feather-ruffling citizen. Well, we see a lot of this, don't we? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Now, that has a limit to it. If the authorities ever ask us to do something or, co or command us to do something that goes against God's perfect and errant word... We're to disobey it. But if not, we're to obey insofar as we can and not be a feather ruffling citizen. The list could go on, but don't be a feather ruffler. It's not a spiritual gift. It's not cute. And it's not just who I am. 
It's sin, and I should aspire to live quietly. Secondly, don't be a nest watcher. He says, to mind your own affairs in the second part of verse 11. Don't be a nest watcher. And I think that this is often incompletely understood as simply just being nosy. But I think there's more on the table here than that. I think it's also keeping up with the Joneses. It's gossip, and it's comparison. Why don't we have what they have? The, Thessalon- the, Thess- the Thessalonians missed the boat here on this one, evidently, because in his second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul has to address some folks who didn't tow the line here. And in chapter 3, verse 11 of that letter, he says, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. You know, the interesting thing about all three of these directives, to not be a feather ruffler, to not be a nest watcher, and we'll see here in a moment, to not be a flock moocher, is that they're so often found together and intertwined, aren't they? The, go- the gossip often usually has so much time to gossip because they have not else to do because they're a flock moocher. Or nest watchers are typically feather rufflers because what other reason does one have to watch nests than just to be able to ruffle feathers about it? So on and so on and so on. And the Bible understands this. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. Both of these ideas tied together. And again, just as with feather ruffling, Siri talking to me there, I don't know where that came from. Just as with feather ruffling, it's not a spiritual gift, it's not cute, and it's not just who we are, we should aspire to mind our own affairs. And then finally, don't be a flock moocher. That's the last part of verse 11. Don't mooch off the flock. It says to work with your hands as we instructed you. And I love the way the Holman uh, study notes commentary uh, kind of works with this. It says you work with your hands because to do otherwise places a burden of dependence on the community of faith and gives a poor testimony to outsiders. Now, we have to be careful here. We have to be careful not to see this as a command to manual labor alone. And that if you're gifted to serve the church or other people in any other way, your gift is just kind of a moot point. Scripture doesn't tell us that at all. Look at Phoebe or Priscilla and Aquila, who, whose gift was generosity and hospitality for evidence of that fact. So Paul's command here is a balance on the other side of the scales of laziness. That's what he's trying to balance. It's not architecture versus contracting work. It's laziness versus industriousness. That's what he's trying to work out. And I love what the writer of Proverbs has to say about laziness. Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Think about that image. That anybody who really never takes care in what they do really just holds hands with destruction. Because it's going to fall apart sooner than later. And that's why Paul writes in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And that whatever you do is further evidence of what we were saying a second ago. You could say it all this way. It doesn't so much matter what you do. It just matters that and how you do it to follow this well. And again, just as with feather ruffling and nest watching, it's not a spiritual gift. It's not cute. And it's not just who we are. It's sin. And thus, we should aspire to work with our hands insofar as Christ has gifted us to do so. Now, let's close this thing. Let's land this plane. We've been exhorted to love well, like Christ, to live well in Christ, and what will that do? What will all of that produce? Leading well other people to Christ. Lead well to Christ. In two different ways. First part of verse 12, he says it'll happen by testimony. It testifies of Christ. So that you may walk properly before outsiders, Paul writes. He tells the Thessalonians that a result of loving and living well will be a proper testimony to the work of Christ in our lives. And he makes this so clear. It's perfect in 1 Corinthians 6. Listen to this. Starting in verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men or women who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Then verse 11. And such were some of you. Such was me. Such was us. Verse 11 though, but, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
So remember that these letters would be read aloud in the churches. I told you to remember that earlier. And I had this humorous thought as I studied and prayed through this. You can almost imagine the people of the church gathered together, right? And they hear this letter read aloud, and they immediately start with this. <clears throat> you know he's talking about you, don't you, doesn't he? You heard that, right? And they would have immediately missed the point. They would have immediately missed the point. Because doing that makes somebody a what? A nest watcher. And a feather ruffler. And a flock moocher. Though it may be tempting to hear these words and be overly inward in our thinking about them, because they will lead to healthier fellowships, Paul's first thought is that the way the church will be perceived by those on the outside, those watching and wondering what to make of this King Jesus that these Christians followed. Loving well and living well are about leading well. Leading others to Christ. Leading others to Christ as we walk in the grace of His finished work. That's a great definition of testimony. Leading others to Christ as we walk in the grace of His finished work. And then finally, he says, lean on Christ. That's the last exhortation that he gives. Be dependent on no one. Coupled with this idea of testimony is this encouragement not to be dependent on anyone, but it's almost as if you can see in the margin, right? Except Jesus. Because we're going to need to depend on Christ. And Scripture is not undoing that truth. It's not going to contradict itself. We hinted to this earlier that some in the Thessalonican church had to be called out about this, right? In chapter 3 of the second letter, he says, For even while we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone's not willing to work, they shouldn't eat. For we hear that some of you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Then check out verse, or, yeah, verse 12. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ, dependent upon Him to do their work quietly and earn their own living. So the command and the encouragement come what? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that same idea unpacked in one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture, which we'll close with. Like the 1 Corinthians passage, Paul very starkly lays it out and unpacks it a bit more here. And pay attention, because you'll hear a couple words about testimony as well. Ephesians 10, or 2, 1-10. through 10. And you were dead in your sins and trespasses in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sins of, diso sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That was our testimony before Jesus to outsiders. But praise God for verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, dependent in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with Him and seated in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the coming ages He might show what? The immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works. But, verse 10, for we are His worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus, dependent on Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, we've heard this morning that our love is to imitate that of Jesus. Jesus showed His love for us by dying for us. The Father shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so perhaps this morning the Holy Spirit has done His work in your heart and caused the light of the Gospel to fall on your hardened heart. And if that's the case, come and have a conversation with me. Come and have a conversation with Cody. We would love to talk with you more about what it means to follow Christ. And to throw yourself upon the mercy of God available in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. And maybe you need to recommit again to loving well and living well and leading well. If so, this altar is open. There's nothing special about it, but you're welcome to come and pray here. You're welcome to find some time and some space to come and pray here about loving and living and leading well. So let's pray together as our, our worship team comes to, to lead us. And as we do, we're going to ask for strength and grace and mercy and joy to love well, live well, and lead well. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the way that it challenges us right where we are. The way that it quickens us. 
And may we not be like the, the person we imagined that would have heard the reading of this letter and immediately started looking around for somebody else to point the finger at and say, well, you see, this is, this is talking about you. May it first sit with us. May we wrestle with what You've called us to do and who You've called us to be. The way that we should love well like You and live well in You and lead others to You. Thank You for this church. For brothers and sisters who can help us in this journey. For brothers and sisters that we can listen to this letter read aloud with. And who we can hold one another accountable through. Lord, for all these things, their graces, their gifts, and we're thankful for them. Let that inform our worship. Let it fill our lungs with your breath of life as we pour forth praise now together. In Christ's name, amen. Stand with us as we sing. today comes from two verses and the first is first John 4 16 that says we love because he that is Jesus first loved us or in first John 3 16 where it goes into more detail by this we know love that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need yet closes his heart against him how does God's love abide in him Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And as we seek to apply this sermon, which has pricked me pretty deeply, I don't know about you, I'm reminded that I can't just will more love. I can't just work harder at being more loving. There's not a switch in my heart that I can flip. I'm going to have to go to the source of love. I'm going to have to go to Christ and ask for it and pursue it and dwell on him to receive that. 
So let's remember that, that this week, and let's pray for that together now. Father God, we ask you for grace that you would give us a measure of love like Christ has for us, like you have for us. Lord, we cannot produce it. It is not natural to us. Lord, give us love with which we might love others. Lord, let it not stop at our front doors. Lord God, let it spill out into our community and our friend groups and whatever sphere of influence that you've given us, Lord. Let it be clear, not that we are loving people, Lord, but the Christ that we follow must be love because it's certainly demonstrated in his people. Lord, in the way that we love and that we serve others, let it not work to our glory but to yours and let people be attracted to Christ because of it. Lord, we ask you for this grace because, again, it is not something we can do in and of ourselves. Lord, we ask it in Christ's name for our greatest good, for the good of those in our community and in this world, and to your glory. And amen. Sing with us our closing song. dark on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land but he'll guide us with his eye and we'll follow till we die we will understand it better by and by by and by when the morning comes when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Oft our cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed, and we've wandered in the darkness, heavy hearted and alone. But we're trusting in the Lord and according to his word We will understand it better by and by By and by when the morning comes When the saints of God are gathered home We will tell the story how we've overcome we will understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares But our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best But we'll understand it better by and by By and by when the morning comes when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell tell the story how we've overcome we will understand it better by and by